Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about measures of variability in statistics. Professor Jacob Gooden here from Point Loma Nazarene University, and in this video, we are going to talk about how to describe your data set using measures of variability. Much like the last video where we looked at measures of central tendency, these measures of variability will help to describe the shape of the curve of your data. How is it distributed? Is it tight or is it spread out? Let's take a look. Okay, this information can be found in the textbook Statistics of Kinesiology by Ware and Vincent. Now some key terms to go over first. Variability is an indice of dispersion. So essentially what we mean by dispersion is how closely grouped or how spread out are your scores. The wider that curve, the more spread out they are and the larger that variability indice will be. The tighter the curve, the more narrow it is, the closer together your scores are spread. They're, they're not spread out very far at all. And so the smaller that indice of variability will be depending on which indice we end up using. So it really describes how the scores are scattered in that distribution. Now we've already talked about range. Range is the largest score minus the smallest score. But we know that range is easily affected by outliers. If you have just one really small score or just one really large score that are outliers from the rest of the data set, it can really skew your range. And thus, the range won't be very descriptive of your data set as a whole. We also have what's called the interquartile range. Now, the interquartile range, or the IQR, is the difference between the raw scores at the 75th and the 25th percentiles. So really, we're just taking those middle two quartiles the, from the 75th down to the 25th percentiles. And what that does is that cuts off any outliers that we might have in the data. And it can also account for skewness of the data. If the, if the data is skewed positively or negatively, then taking that interquartile range will help to control for that and can be more descriptive of your data set. Now we also have what's called variance. Variance is the sum of squared deviation scores about the mean divided by the number of scores minus one. So we'll parse out what that means here in a second. But to move on, the standard deviation is the square root of variance. So basically you do the same calculation you did for variance and then you take the square root of it. And this is the most frequently used indice of variability. It should be used to summarize variability in a data set and it's the easiest measure of variability to interpret. Okay, so let's take a look at how to calculate variance as well as standard deviation. So first to find variance, we have to calculate what are called deviation scores. And these are just the differences between each raw score and the mean. So if we take the sum of all deviations, this would be equal to zero because the mean is in the middle of the data. So every score on this side we'll have an analogous score on this side that will eventually average out if we add up all of those deviations to get zero. If you don't get zero when you add up the deviations, it means you, you selected the wrong mean. It means you didn't calculate it correctly. So we have to square them so that A, it gets rid of the sign, and B, we can add them all together, and then we get an actual value instead of just zero for our deviation. So to find variance, we will first square the deviation values, we'll add up the squared values, and then divide that by the number of scores. Variance is kind of like the average of the sums of squared deviation scores. Now, if we're calculating the variance of an entire population, we've measured every score in a population, there's nobody else we could measure in that population, then we would divide it by the total number of scores, or by n. But if we just have a smaller sample of that, of that larger population, let's say the population of Americans is somewhere around, I don't know, 300 million maybe, give or take, and we can only measure 10,000 of them. That's still a lot, but it's a very small subset of that much larger population. Then we would use n minus one. n minus one is a way to acknowledge that the standard deviation of that sample is slightly different than the standard deviation of the population. By subtracting that one 
we are removing one degree of freedom from our standard deviation. Okay, so here's a table looking at deviations from the mean. So we have two different sets of data. We have scores denoted by X and then by Y, and they are two different data sets. And you'll see just by looking at them, we go 27, 26, 25, 24, 23 for the X values. And you can see that 25 is right in the middle, so that's probably going to be the mean. And same thing with the Y values, but notice how much farther they are spread apart. Okay, so 25 is the mean in both cases. However, the Y values have much greater spread. So we would, we would imagine logically that once we calculate the deviations as well as the variance and standard deviation for these two different data sets, each having five values, that the Y values will have much greater variability. So if we were just to take the deviation scores, we see that 27 has a deviation score of two, 26 has a deviation score of 1, 25 has a deviation score of 0 because, of course, 25 is also the mean here. 24 has a deviation score of negative 1 because it's below the mean, and 23 has a deviation score of negative 2 because it's below the mean. And the sum of all those is 0. Looking over at the Y column, we have the same thing, but notice the deviation scores are much larger. 10, 5, 0, negative 5, negative 10, but again they add up to 0. If we were to take the absolute value of these, then we would get 6 for the x values and 30 for the y values. Now when we're looking at this table, we notice that the mean for both of these is 25 centimeters. It's calculated right here. And so the, just the mean alone is not very descriptive of this data set. The mean alone is not very descriptive. We do have the absolute values of deviations from the mean, but what we actually want to calculate is variance. So here's how we do that. Instead of taking the absolute values of the deviations, we take the square of the deviation. So here is a column showing the square of the deviations from x, and then the square of the deviations from y. And so now we see that when we sum those up, we get 10, and we get 250. And then to calculate variance, we will denote variance by the letter V here. We just divide that by the total number of scores. So we have the total number of scores being 5. So 10 divided by 5 is 2 centimeters, and 250 divided by 5 is 50 centimeters. So in this case, we see that the data set of X scores has a variance of just 2, whereas the data set of Y values has a variance of 50. So there's a really big difference between the two. They have the same mean, which is 25, but the x values have a variance of 2 and the y values have a variance of 50. Now we didn't apply here the correction, the n minus 1 correction for the degrees of freedom that we would apply to sample data because these are just numbers that aren't actually representing any actual measurement of a sample or a population. Okay, so we just keep it at n on the denominator. Here's the equation that we use, right? So v equals variance and it is the sum of all um, scores minus the mean squared over the number of scores. Okay, that's an interpretation of this equation. Now, if we wanted to calculate the standard deviation, which when we're talking about the population, that's denoted by this Greek character sigma, we would simply take the square root of that. The square root of the sum of all scores minus the mean squared over the total number of scores. Now, as I said before, when calculating the variance of a sample, we have to subtract one from the denominator when calculating the standard deviation of a sample. So we apply this correction factor to make sure that our estimate is not biased by the small sample that we have. But you'll notice if you're using a very large data set, the standard deviation of the sample versus of the population will actually be very close. As soon as you get above n equals 50, those values start to get very close to each other. So going back to our original example of the x values and the y values, We've already determined that the y values have a much greater variance, but what is the exact standard deviation of each of these groups of numbers? So here we have the variance scores. Remember that was 2 and 50 for the x and the y values. 
Now let's compute standard deviation. So remember, standard deviation is just the square root of variance. So for the x values, we get 1.6. And for the y values, we get 7.9. Now the great thing about standard deviation is that it is in the units of the original calculation. So what we'll often see in research or in statistics is that a researcher will report the mean, and then they will say plus or minus the standard deviation. And that standard deviation is in the units of that original measurement. So if it's reporting back squat 1RMs, they might have a group of 20 subjects, and maybe the mean is 140 kilograms. So they might write 140 plus or minus, and let's say the standard deviation was 10 kilograms. So plus or minus 10 kilograms. And that would represent the mean plus or minus the standard deviation. And that will describe for you the data set much better than just giving a measure of central tendency or just the measure of variance. But now we have both to describe this data set. Now the last measure of variability to look at is the coefficient of variation. Now the coefficient of variation is kind of like a standard score for variability. It describes the variability in terms of a percent. So this is particularly helpful if we want to do something like compare the variation between two different scores that use different units. So a 1RM back squat would use kilograms, whereas a vertical jump would use centimeters. Coefficient of variation allows us to normalize the standard deviation by dividing by the mean, and then we multiply it by 100. To continue using our same example from those five X scores and the five Y scores, if we simply divide the standard deviation by 25, as seen here and here, then we would get these two different coefficients of variation, 6.4% and 31.6% respectively. And so again, we can see with this third measure of variability that the y values have much greater variability. But each of, each of these different measures, while they tell us the same thing, they tell it to us in different ways and they're useful in different situations when reporting our data. Now, what's really neat is that the standard deviations and the normal distribution have a relationship that we can count upon to de when, when describing our data. So when n is large and close to normally distributed, there are usually five or six standard deviations within the range of a data set. Now here's a normal bell-shaped curve or a Gaussian curve, and what's charted out on multiple x-axes, we have the standard deviations. So let's start there. Here, this midline, of course, is the mean and median and mode in this case, because it's a standard normal curve. And so if we go to the right of the curve, we have the first standard deviation here, and to the left, we have the first standard deviation there. And we what we find is that actually 68% of all data falls within these two points. Okay, and this will be consistent for any sufficiently large data set that's normally distributed. And if we go out to two deviations, standard deviations above and below the mean, now we have 95% of the data falling between these two points. Okay, so a great way to describe scores then could be in terms of standard deviations, which is where we'll get into calculating Z standard scores a little bit later. Um, and as you keep moving out, less and less data falls to uh, three, four, or five standard deviations outside of the mean. Now we can go further down and look at cumulative percent percentages or percentiles. And we can see that right here at zero, of course, we have 50% of data is, is falling below the mean. And if we keep going up in standard deviations, we have 84% of data falling below one standard deviation and 97.8 falling below two standard deviations, etc., etc. And then if we take a look at the percentiles, we see that most of them are actually clustered between one and negative one standard deviations. And then as you get outside of one standard deviation above and below the mean, those percentiles get more and more spread out, similar to what we've talked about previously, where if you are an elite athlete or somebody who's elite in whatever measurement you are you're considering, maybe it's SAT scores, or maybe it's back squat 1RM, or maybe it's IQ points. If you are at the very high or the very low ranges, then an improvement in your score 
will not result in a large jump in percentiles. And that's just because percentiles at that level are so spread out. Whereas if you're in the middle of the pack, the same, the same absolute size of improvement will lead to a bigger jump in percentiles. And that's just because they're more clustered there between one standard deviation above and below the mean. Okay guys, thanks for checking out Measures of Variability with me. If you had any questions, I'd love to connect with you in the comments section, so leave them for me down there. If you missed it, check out the video where I showed you how to calculate most of these measures in Excel and in SPSS. Okay guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video. If you have any questions though, let me